Hello guys, welcome to another tutorial video. In this video, we'll be talking about iron metabolism. All right, so how iron is absorbed, transported, and stored in our body. Now, first we're going to look on the uses of this element iron. So iron is a very important element. It is used in hemoglobin synthesis, and hemoglobin is an important part of erythropoiesis which is involved in making our red blood cells. Now we require about 20 to 25 milligram per day for erythropoiesis to be normal. All right, so your sources of iron may be supplements or it may be dietary, which is more common. So dietary include your liver, your eggs, and your green vegetables. However, it should be noted that only one milligram per day is required for intake. This is because 95% of your high iron sorry, comes from your old red blood cells when they are broken down to release these irons and it's recycled. However, you require one milligram per day because there's some amount of iron that is released from your sweat um, during excretion from urine and also your feces. All right, now let's look on the absorption of iron. So iron, when it enters your body, usually through diet, it is in the ferric state or the Fe3 plus state. However, we need to get iron in the Fe2 plus state in order for it to be absorbed. Now for this, gastric juice is very important in the reduction of iron and therefore an acidic environment is required for this process. So for example, your vitamin C, if you should take it with iron supplement, it can boost the absorption of your iron because vitamin C is ascorbic acid, okay? So if you're taking antacid because of problems in your digestive system, it can also reduce your iron absorption. And if you should take out your stomach or do a gasectomy, um, then this can also cause you to develop anemia due to a lack of iron absorption. Now the major absorption site for your iron is your duodenum and your upper jejunum. Most of the iron absorption occurs in your duodenum and this is because you will expect that your duodenum will be more acidic than your upper jejunum because it's closer um, to the stomach. All right, so the more acidic the greater the absorption. So iron can enter the enterocytes of your duodenum via two receptors. It can be the HCP1 receptors or the DMT1 receptors. First, let's look on the HCP1 receptors. So heme is containing your iron and another molecule which we'll talk about as we go along. And we're basically interested in the iron from the heme. So an enzyme called heme oxygenase can act on heme to release iron, all right? The second stage is where you're at, you have your dietary Fe3+, plus, as is converted to Fe2+, plus, ready to enter your enterocyte, and it binds to the DMT1 receptor, which is another receptor, and then it enters for absorption. Now, two enzymes are very, very important in your enterocytes. We have the Fasting, which is basically at the basal section of your enterocyte. So when the iron is leaving to be transported, right, we convert it to Fe3 plus in order for this process to occur. But we'll talk about the transportation soon. And there's also an enzyme called ferric reductase that is at the apical section of your enterocytes that can also convert your Fe3 plus to Fe2 plus. As you can see from the name reductase, we're reducing your iron. So now we're going to focus our attention on the transportation of our iron molecule. Two mechanisms for iron transport exist. Pinocytosis, which is where erythrocytes precursors, they absorb iron from macrophages by a process called pinocytosis. And as you know, macrophage, or we'll get to this, is a storage for iron but is a minor storage next we're going to look on transferring transferring is the most common or the principal way by which iron is moving or being transported now it's a protein and it has two binding sites so two molecules 
of iron is transported each time. Very efficient. Huh? So the synthesis of transferrin occurs in the liver like most things in the body, but it is inversely um, proportional to your storage. So if you have a lot of iron in storage, you don't need to transport as much iron to be stored. However, if there is low storage of iron, you want to get all those iron out of your interior sites to be stored, right, and stack up on more iron. So transferrin is dependent on the transferrin receptors, right, in different areas. So TFR1 receptors are on different sites in your body. One of the most common is your bone marrow. And this is where the transferrin binds on your TFR1 receptors in your bone marrow to, for the bone marrow to use the iron to produce your red blood cells. After the old red blood cells are used and damaged, they go to the reticular endothelial system, such as the spleen, and they, there they are broken down to release iron. And now this iron can go back to the plasma to bind to more transferrin. Right, so most of the iron binding to the transferrin is those from damaged cells that are recycled. Next, let's look on the storage of your iron. So iron is mainly stored in ferritin, and ferritin is a water-soluble molecule consisting of a micelles of iron, as well as a core consisting of ferric hydroxyphosphatase. So it has OH ions as well as oxygen ions and a coat or covering called apoferritin. Now ferritin storage is proportional to the iron um, concentration. So if there is a high iron concentration then you need to remove some of it and store it. However if the concentration of iron is low you need iron for red blood cells to continue to make them so there is not enough leave for storage so storage of iron becomes very low now there's another molecule called emosiderin and this is also a minor storage of iron it is basically an aggregate of ferritin molecules however it is stripped of the apoferritin so there's no outer coating and it is insoluble so it's less accessible so the body doesn't really store in it however it is a main storage in the macrophages while ferritin is the main source in your hepatocytes all right so i forgot to mention epsidin um when we're talking about after the old blood cells return to the reticular endothelial system and are released from the macrophage this process is actually controlled by epsidin right and is proportional to the iron stored so epsidin is upregulated when the iron stores are high, but is downregulated when the iron stores are low. So the last thing that we're going to touch on briefly is your iron deficiency anemia. So iron deficiency, lack of iron. You're not taking in enough iron to your diet, so you're one milligram per day. Or you could be having chronic blood loss. So you're losing a lot of blood, you're losing a lot of iron and red blood cell, etc. Or it could mean that there is an increase in demand of oxygen because, not oxygen, sorry, iron, because of puberty or you're going through menstruation. And also malabsorption. So remember that acid is needed for absorption of iron, converting it to the ferrostate. So if you have the removal of your stomach or your stomach not functioning properly, producing that acid, then you're going to have a problem with the absorption of iron. Now on histology, when you do a blood film um, in severe iron deficiency, you will find that the cells are smaller than the normal red blood cells, which is microcytic. And also there is usually a central area of pallor that is usually two thirds the size, size of the red blood cell in normal patients. However, as you can see, it is expanding in this picture. So it is much, much greater than the normal pallor. And this is called hypochromic anemia. It's a chromic color, right? So it's clear, so it's hypochromic, right? And yes, that's it for this video. See you 
in the next one.